Buenas and half a day. Inan Husi Edward Leon Guerrero. In Guahusi, Vanessa Duenas, and we are a part of the Manumku Tumanhoban Oral History Project. The Manumku Tumanhoban Oral History Project works to document valuable cultural knowledge from our elders to be able to share with the public, especially our youth. These videos cover a wide range of topics relevant to Tamaru culture and history. This project seeks to make up for the gap of the transmission of cultural knowledge due to the COVID-19 pandemic and is funded through the Governor's Education Assistance and Youth Empowerment Grant Program. We are so excited to be able to document these stories, to be able to share with you today. We, we hope, hope you, you enjoy. enjoy. This short video features Saina Judy Flores. She shares with us fond memories she has of fishing as a community in the village of Inalahan. She describes this cultural practice as an event that the whole village would partake in, where they used a wide-ranging taladza. We present to you, Tying Our Community Through Fishing, No One Left Unfed by Judy Flores. Judith Selk Flores. Uh, I arrived uh, with my family, my parents and siblings in 1957 and we have lived here ever since. We were the first uh, white family to be uh, stationed in Inarahan where my parents were teaching. And that was when they used to have the annual uh, manyahak runs, uh, not manyahak, the uh, macro, the atule uh, runs in the bay. And now it's become commercialized. You have to get a license. Private families do it, businesses do it, but it's not a village event. When the fishermen could see that the uh, mackerel were ready, there were schools of mackerel out there ready to come into the bay, they'd be watching. And this happened all over the island, but in, in, in Aloha, and that's what I'm familiar with. So uh, as soon as the mackerel was coming into the bay, all the fishermen got together and sewed their nets together and they blocked the bay. So there were the fishermen with boats and then there were the fishermen that, that loaned their nets and there were uh, fishermen that helped sew. You know, everybody had a role and everybody was compensated uh, from the catch by what they contributed. So, so it was a whole event where when the mackerel were coming in, the fishermen were the first ones very active. And as, as they pulled the nets in, then they needed more people to pull the nets. So even children and women and everybody was involved in pulling these heavy nets in. And then as the nets were, were pulled in, those that were in charge would start piling up the fish. And they were piling it according to who was going to get a, a share of this catch. And then the important thing was there was always a share for those that came last minute and helped and pulled in the nets. Those that did anything special, you know, that just helped, helped out. Those who stopped by and just wanted to see. And, uh, and always for the, the sick and the elderly, everybody in the village was provided for. So uh, to me, that was, that was the fabric of the village. So that's a very fond memory. This video features a retired park ranger of Guam National Wildlife Refuge, La Texan, Saina Emily Sablon. She shares with us fond memories she has of life growing up on the ranch. She explains how having a place to be able to have a connection with the land is beneficial for oneself. She also shares with us the importance of maintaining this relationship by growing your own food from the earth and that when you take care of the earth, the earth will take care of you. We present to you, The Natla Lanzo by Emily Sablan. Buenas enough, de Guahutsi, Senora Emily Guerrero Sablan. I was born in the beautiful, the most beautiful decade of um, January 1950. Eight children born to Maria and Jose Sablon, my parents. Um, of course, we had Nana then. Uh, Nana lived with us and oldest brother. And uh, I'm down to the six. I'm six, number six out of eight. So third to the youngest. My Tata uh, was um, 
notorious for doing, and he would plant a tree for every child born. My tree fell, I think, three typhoons ago. So it's like the house was tin and wood, the initial entrance, there was no door, only the side door that leads up from to the main bedroom, but to the main entrance, it was like um, open air, and Dad's bed was there with his shotgun. And so that housed many people. When there's going to be a fiesta, or there's going to be harvesting, or there's going to be putting plants on the ground. This uh, place here, now for some reason, is called Matagwak. But I remembered my father telling friends that uh, we live in Chaguian. Mm -hmm. And the next time I heard of Chaguian was that it came back and was involved in cultural and, um, and tomorrow studies. And I heard of the Chaguian massacre, mm -hmm. which really heightened my attention because I said, I know where that is. I grew up in that area, only, only to find out just maybe five years ago how close it is mm -hmm. to where, where the Chaguian massacre and validated my claim, which my parents thought I was uh, telling stories. I used, my sister and I used to see Japanese looking soldiers hiding behind banana trees with their funny looking hats that had flaps, cloth like flaps. And Nana said, stop fibbing, stop telling stories. But we were not telling stories, we really saw. Um, the soldier looking people up here. We didn't know they were Japanese. I know that now, but we, we didn't even know there was a war. The, uh, the how, how, just how recent. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Our favorite, Diu, hide and seek, Diu. Because you can hide just about anywhere and you can camouflage yourself into a tree by breaking a tanning tongue and then just put it over your head and don't move. Diu is one of them. Um, we made kites. We made kites from newspapers and use, and, and use, um, rice for paste to make the stick, the rib, the coconut rib stick to your um, kite and for the tail so that you can extend the tail. We made karet and hadzu and then and any disposed um, car baby carriage, we would take that thing apart and take the wheels and, and make carts and have races. Out, out in the in the grass, we we made do with what we got. We were very innovative, and that's where that's where skills and and um, and Im imagination uh, comes in handy. During harvest time, um, one of the ones that I loathe was Dad would grow some corn, but that's only for our consumption. And the, the word gugan, I hated that word because that means shucking the corn off. And um, I, we didn't have tools. And so you, you had to gingerly peel it off and it gets like, squishy. But watching the corn, People who lived in far in in uh, ranches would know what I mean by mamulan maiz. Mamulan maiz is watching the corn, watching it how after it's shucked and.
put out on a mat in the on the on the ground on the mat only for the corn. We cannot sleep on that mat. That's only for the corn. And we have to watch the crows, the 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 black crows, the uh, Sali, the other birds that would come to try to eat it. And so we would be set up with a little camp with our dolls and stuff, and the corn would be out there. And we have a pile of rocks <laughs> or a stick so that when they come, we just throw it at them or get up and, and boo them to shoo them away. That was the, the chore for children. Watch the corn. And it was the most boring thing because <laughs> And you just sit there and watch the corn. And um, Nana would be doing something. And, but that, that was a chore during harvest, harvest time. Not much. Oh, and, and then after harvest, when we're trying to grow new crops, would be the halak. Halak means weeding, weeding the plot of, um, of invasive uh, plants or or weeds. Yep, yep. So that that was it. Simple. Yep. Oh, the first and foremost is knowing how the earth, the ground, can feed you. If you plant it and you water it, or with the good graces of of nature. You will have something to eat. And I used to hear my father in the 60s would say, Taza tatao sinan yalang binigi tanota. And that means there is no person that can ever go hungry here in our island. And that's true. The earth would take care of you if you take care of it. That's simple. And um, just the joy of of having somewhere else to go other than the house and you go and you really so to speak sow your wild oats you can be crazy and run a mark at the ranch that you cannot do you can't scream in the village because somebody will tell on you here at the ranch you can let it all out play loud music because you you nobody will bother you it's just very refreshing. It, it life was like no other, and at where I'm at, where I'm at with age, um, I just had the best times at the ranch, with or without uh, a party. Every day was like like a party. You can, my dad would make us a swing, and we all have our own little area. We don't have to fight for a swing. There were swings everywhere. And you can, if you're a loner, you can go and sit and swing and be alone for a while. So, yeah, that that's the big loss is not being out in nature, not being free to just get away and think without the hassles of well, now we say city life, um, which is not always. A pleasant Sunday. This video features cultural artist Sina Judy Flores. She shares with us fond memories of hearing Kantan Samorita being sung throughout the village of Inalahan. She describes what Kantan Samorita is and what is needed in order to participate in it. Sina Judy also shares with us the importance of the practice in Samoru culture and how taking control of the Samoru language is important in revitalizing this ancient practice. We present to you Echoes Throughout the Village, Contents Morita by Judy Flores. Na'anha si Judith Selk Flores. Uh, I arrived uh, with my family, my parents and siblings in 1957, and we have lived here ever since. We were the first uh, white family to be uh, stationed in Inarahan, where my parents were teaching. 
Uh, I'm the oldest of four siblings. Um, uh, my brother is uh, two years younger than me, and then uh, a sister two years younger than him, and uh, a youngest sister two years younger. So uh, I am the oldest. You know, that's one of my fondest memories growing up in Inalahan. Uh, we lived in the middle of the village. Uh, uh, we, we rented a, the second story uh, from the Diego family. And uh, Commissioner Diego was the longtime chief commissioner of Inarahan, very well known. And uh, so we became like family. They had 12 children, so I had several in the family that were about my age. And I recall, you know, that we we would be sitting in the evenings, and this was before there was television, um, and it, it was very quiet, mm -hmm. and people would be in their outside kitchens, on their, on their front landings, just enjoying the breeze. And somebody would start, and you could hear it, and, and, and all of a sudden, my, my friends would say, wait, somebody's singing. And they look forward to it. It's just so, uh, so magical. So it's usually the people, the Maino clan over on the seaside that would start. And, and it might be, um, often it was just somebody doing their work and they might be, they might have a slight grudge or they wanted to make fun of somebody next door. And they would just start, you know, just, just a little, little catchy uh, four line uh, verse. And Pretty soon, somebody would answer. And depending on, you know, what was going on in the village, it could be uh, making fun of each other, or it could be there might be some romantic undertones, uh, making, you know, just, uh, just a social way to vent. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it was just fun. And then, then as, as the song went on, it, it became a competition, and it would be between houses. The uh, another neighbor would chime in because they had something that they could say, and they could, you know, the the object is to make it rhyme, to follow the tune, and to make it rhyme, and to follow that format. So, it, it, you know, there were all these factors in it. You know, being clever, making it rhyme, uh, getting your point across. Uh, and the many, many layers of meaning that went with it. And it was just a very delightful way to, to spend an evening. I can tell you when television came, that, was, that took over the entertainment. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> Again, I have this picture of the first television in the village and houses were open. Most of them didn't even have screens. And of course, the, the custom is to take off your, your zoris, your slippers at the door. And the first people who had television were just down the street from me and you knew they had their TV on because there was a dozen zoris outside the door. All the neighbors were coming to watch TV. Mm -hmm. And that became the primary form of entertainment. And uh, it just continued from there. I mean, uh, how many centuries have they tried to wipe out the Chamorro language? And, you know, it was since since the naval government, you know, was and I'm not saying they were they were being malicious about it. It was just this is how you get ahead in the English speaking world. You need to speak English. So that was constant uh, to parents. And then the other factor was you get more things piled on top of that. You get the TV in English and you get all the, the advertisements and the footage and the movies and everything from the States. Um, and, and it even went further back than that. You had the movies um, at the theaters uh, ever since the naval government came in in the early 1900s, they had the Gaiety Theater and uh, the cowboy songs and the cowboy, you know, culture. 
So there were all these influences uh, that that changed the life more rapidly than I think it had, had ever been changed. And uh, that was kind of what happened. I think just just the the makeup of, of the family. I it's very important, especially down here. I think that, uh, you know, there was always extended family, and um, now there's more of a nuclear family where it's the mother, the father, and the kids, and if they're lucky, they have a grandmother, grandfather, an aunt, you know, to help out because. Uh, what has changed so much is that both parents are working and they have to work because of the economy today. The economy's changed. You can't go out into the, you know, and you can farm, but but it, it just doesn't pay the bills that are, are required today. So that's, that's an unfortunate thing, I think, that has changed uh, the lifestyle of the kids today. Um, and again, you know, the the grandmother, if they're lucky, they have a grandmother and somebody who can help uh, carry on some of the practices. And uh, if they don't, uh, unfortunately, their their babysitter is the electronics. I pray for that. I really wish it could happen. And it depends on on this generation taking uh, control of the Chamorro language again, learning how to speak it. And because there's such, you know, to, to make a poem, you have to have command of, of the language. And very few people now have that command of, of manipulating the language to, to, to make poetry and to make songs. So uh, it depends on this generation. I, I feel for the kids today because they don't hear Cantan Chamorita, and if they hear it, they don't understand it, you know, and, and that's so sad. I, I always want them to, to be proud of their culture, to be proud of their heritage. This video was actually a treasure that we were able to capture after we had finished our interview with Sina Juan Beneventi. We were lucky enough to keep the cameras rolling as he sang for us this song, calling on our youth to take action and to respect one another. In the song, he sings, our culture is very important in the times ahead. Do not lose our language. Protect the land in the future, Famagu'un. And we'll all say, Fanogi Tsamoru. Stand up, Tsamorus. We present to you, Kotarata, a song of protest by Juan Beneventi. Famagona tendemon a squel and mizu. Silena la mampus macad gita nota. El comog dan pan manos gigisain and mizu. E maestra dan e maestru. Cutterata gopin putanti. Monasia Gitempo, Ilingua Hita Mugamana Falingo, Prote Hito Rumona, Ipamagunitano, Data Sang Antalo, Pano Gitamoro, Data Sang Antalo, Pano Gitamoro. That's a protest song that was created in the 1990s during the, move, the Chamorro movement. That's a, that's a new song, not an old one. That, it's part of that. And basically for you, it is saying that children of the land, listen to your teachers and your elders for life in the land is hard. Listen, and then it says, the Chamorro language 
is important. And not to forget it, to remember it, to practice it. It was such a great experience to be able to capture these unique stories from our Manamku to be able to share with you today. We hope you enjoyed them as much as we do. You can stay up to date on our project by following us on Instagram, Facebook, and X at Manamku to Manhoven. You can also access our videos on our YouTube channel at Manamku to Manhoven. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much, much for watching. watching. Esta. Esta.